number one. Second Peter, chapter number one. We're going to use our Bibles approximately nine times tonight, I think, is what we're going to do. Last night, I preached a portion of this sermon because of the graduation service and the award ceremony. I wasn't able to preach a full-length message, but I was able to give you the first four points, which I'm going to repeat tonight because some of you were not here last night. And uh, I'm also going to finish the sermon. I think I've got eight, nine, nine points all together. And I'll be preaching all nine points, God willing, uh, tonight. And uh, I am excited to be able to uh, give you this message from the Word of God tonight. And so God is so good. Hey, good evening. Good to see you all. And uh, it's follow well time. All right. No. <laughs> Just had to give you a little ribbon there. Just a little ribbon. What was that? Oh, it's all right. I always would rather have you late than not at all. So praise the Lord. And uh, we'll just pray for you, to uh, God, to speak to your heart about clocks and so. No. <laughs> You'll let me come get everybody? Okay. I, well, years ago when I had five children all at home, it was a normal thing too. So I understand. <laughs> so Second Peter chapter 1. Are you there? Second Peter, yes, okay, thank you. <laughs> Chapter one, look at verse number five. It says, and beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge and to knowledge temperance and to temperance patience and to patience godliness and to godliness brotherly kindness. Tonight, we'll be talking about the, uh, these things, part number eight, and the title of my message is this, to godliness brotherly kindness. We're going to talk about brotherly kindness tonight. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so very much for allowing us to be here this evening. I love you, Jesus, and I'm so grateful for all that you do for us. Thank you for being our God. I pray, Lord, now at this time that you'll fill me with your power. I ask you for the mind of Christ. Tell me to say only that which you once said. And I pray for every person here to have ears to hear, a heart to receive, and a mind to comprehend. Father, please do a work in our midst that only you can do. We'll give you all the glory for it. Bless those that are watching online. Thank you for this opportunity to be in church tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. To godliness, brotherly kindness. Okay, just real quick, real quick, a review of what we've already discussed. We've discussed if you want to be a Christian that never falls, that means never falling into sin, a life of sin, never falling out of the will of God, and never falling into the snare and trap of the devil. If you want to be a Christian that never sins, or I'm sorry, never falls, then you've got to have that foundation of faith. The foundation of faith is twofold. It's number one, faith in Jesus Christ alone for salvation. Number two, faith in the word of God to being how you believe, and how you live as a Christian. All of your final authority is the word of God in what you believe and in what you do. Not a contemporary Christian attitude, not a secular worldview, but a biblical worldview when it comes to life. So when you establish the foundation of faith, God says if you never wanna fall, there are seven things you need to add to your foundation of faith. The first thing is virtue. Do you remember what virtue is defined as? What is virtue? It is, it starts with an M, Moral excellence, all right. From the penalty box all the way back there, all right. Moral excellence, that's high standards, high convictions, purity, living, holiness, living, moral excellence, virtue. You add to your faith virtue, then add to virtue knowledge. Knowledge is a clear and certain perception of truth, that which is reality, and that which is factual. That's what knowledge is. And you've got to have knowledge. With error, you're never going to be a successful Christian. With false doctrine, you're never going to be a successful Christian. You got to have knowledge. So you add to your faith virtue, add to virtue knowledge, add to knowledge temperance. Temperance is two things. What is the first definition or first part of temperance? It is starts with the letter S. Okay, come on now. Temperance, it starts with the letter S. The first part of it is self-control. Who said it? Right over there? All right, pray, both of you. Okay. Oh, David, all right. Self-control. The second aspect of, of temperance is being 
Starts with the letter L, being, not long-suffering, being led of the, who said it? Miss Catherine, led of the Spirit. So temperance is self-control while being led of the Spirit. Okay, so you add to your faith virtue, add to virtue knowledge, to knowledge temperance, to temperance patience. Patience is defined primarily with two words. The first word starts with the letter C. The second word starts with the letter E. Do you remember what patience is? It is, starts with the letter C. Cheer, cheerful, cheerful, and then letter E, endurance. There you go. So patience is not just enduring and having a, you know, being all mad and angry and pouty or griping and complaining. That's not patience. Patience is enduring, but you do it cheerfully. You do it with a positive attitude. You're sitting there singing Hap, uh, zippity doo da, zippity day. My oh my, what a wonderful day. Now, that's called patience. That's all in the Greek, okay? So, I mean, I just got that from my studies of the original language and all of that. Zippity doo da. All right. But when you're patient, you, you not only endure, but you do it cheerfully with a good attitude about it. All right. So, you add to your faith virtue, add to virtue knowledge, add to knowledge temperance add to temperance patience and then last week we learned you add to patience it starts with the letter g what is it called godliness what is godliness well it's two things the first thing is it's capturing the heart of god so in other words you you feel towards things like god does so you love what god loves and you have his heart the second thing about godliness is a life that is devoted to seeing lost souls saved and a life that is devoted to the kingdom of God. That's godliness. So if you want to be a godly Christian, then you must love what God loves and then do what God does. And what God primarily does is he sees lost souls saved and then he devotes his time, effort, energy to the kingdom of God. And that's basically found in the local New Testament church right now. And so that's what godliness is. Now, number uh, part number eight, but the sixth thing that we need of seven in order to never fall as a Christian is brotherly kindness. Let me give you nine thoughts tonight about brotherly kindness. Number one, brotherly kindness is fraternal affection. Fraternal affection affection what is that talking about well two things it's the love which christians cherish for each other as brothers and sisters in the family of god you know one of the things that is real important is family every one of us should have two families we should have our earthly family that's our mother father brother sister cousins and you know but primarily those that live in your home if you're married it's your spouse and your children and uh, if you're a child it's your parents and then your siblings but family's important one of the things that hurts my heart in our society is so many people just don't care about family i mean they just don't care children don't care about loving and respecting and being loyal to their parents parents leave their kids alone don't even care about them just let them be and don't really pay attention much to them. And uh, siblings fighting more, you know, with each other than actually loving each other. It's just sad. But family is supposed to be, there's not another human relationship that should be more important than your family. The ones that live in the household with you now. I'm not talking about all of your extended family. I met this one guy last week. He has over 200 relatives that all live in this area. I mean, what do you know, man? A family of 200, <laughs> good grief. And he knows them all, right? Uh, but the fact is, I mean, you got a large family that live in the area, don't you, Tammy? Well, how many do you think, all together do you think it is? Like at least 70, right? Maybe more than 70, right? But, uh, but so when I talk about your family, what I'm primarily talking about, obviously, is your household. That's what I'm primarily talking about. Either the household that you grew up in or the household that you have by marriage. Regardless of either one, your household. 
you should be tight. You should love each other. You should really care about each other. I mean, you know, the thing about your family, think about this, ready? All the, all the children that hate their parents or all the children that don't like their parents, who gave you your parents? The Lord did. Think about that one. See, when you get married, you get to choose your spouse. Now, obviously, if you're dedicated to the Lord, you feel like the Lord led you to whoever you married. So then you can say, well, I got married because of God, which is fine. I don't mind you saying that at all. But no matter what, when you got married, there was a choice that you made. You said to someone, will you marry me? And if you were the recipient of that, you either said, I do or no way, Jose. <laughs> Uh, hit the road, Jack. <laughs> Don't come back no more. Uh, but he said yes, right? So you had a choice in the matter. Do you know you never had a single choice when it came to your parents? <sighs> you never had a choice. God's the one that chose who your mother and your father would be. You think God makes mistakes? I don't think he makes any mistakes. You say, I didn't have a Christian mom or a Christian dad. Well, it, it really doesn't matter. God gave you to your parents. Your attitude toward them should be an attitude of love. Now, I know, I know, believe me, as a pastor for 28 years, I know there are some pretty terrible parents out there in the world today. Abuse their kids, neglect their kids, take advantage of their kids. And then there are those parents that is unimaginable that kill their kids. And I'm not talking just about abortion now. I'm talking about, I, I see all across the country almost every week or every other week, you can hear of a report of some mom or some dad who took the life of their kids. And uh, it's just terrible. So I do understand there are some parents that, boy, it's hard to just completely love them because of how they They've treated you. But that's the rare occasion. That's not like normal. It's not like every household has abuse. Every household has neglect. Every household has, you know, whatever. That's not always the case. And in fact, that's really the minority. But I think every one of us, if we have living parents, we should really love them. I mean, I don't care if they're saved or lost. You ought to love them. I mean, God gave you to them. You're, you didn't pick your parents, and guess what? You didn't pick your siblings either, so you should love your siblings. And the truth of the matter is, when it comes to the household that you were raised in or the household that you live in right now, primarily by marriage, you know, you're now married and you have kids, there ought to be love there. You ought to love the family. But there's a bigger family that God deals with right now in this passage that we're supposed to love, and that's the family of God. Brothers and sisters in Christ, brotherly kindness. This is to love Christians, cher uh, uh, cherish uh, 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 the love which Christians cherish for each other as brothers and sisters in the family of God. We need to love each other, we really do, as brothers and sisters in Christ. Then, the word kindness. The word kindness is this. That, and now this is a long definition, so you might not get every word, but just get the gist of it. That temper or disposition which delights in contributing to the happiness of others, exercised cheerfully in gratifying their wishes, supplying their wants, and alleviating their distresses. Did you get all that, Tracy? You got it all? Okay, good. So that's a, that's a, that's a mouthful, isn't it? I'm, I don't know if anybody here got all of that. But you understand what I'm saying. Kindness, I'll say it again. That temper or disposition which delights in contributing to the happiness of others, exercised cheerfully in gratifying their wishes, supplying their wants, and alleviating their distresses. That is kindness. Do you know if we had more kindness in the world today, the world would be a better place? It just surely would be. There's never a time that's appropriate to be rude to anybody. There's never a time ever 
that's appropriate to be evil to anybody. I was thinking, I was talking to my mom. My mom came to church this morning, and it was a blessing to see her. I was having lunch with my mom and my son, Joey, and uh, we were discussing that shooting down in Texas and just some of the details about it. The more I delve into it, the more I learn about it, the more disgusted I am, the more angry I am, the more hurt I feel. Oh, my soul. It's just, it's just terrible what happened down in Texas last Tuesday. But one of the things that I was thinking about is if that 18-year-old boy, and I'm going to call him a boy because he didn't act like a man, that 18-year-old boy that committed those atrocities, somehow he missed kindness. Just being kind to people. Kindness. If you would live your life with kindness as a rule, you would never have to worry about shooting anybody. You would never have to worry about hurting people. You would never have to worry about road rage. I mean, if you just were kind, just kind. And God says, if you want to be a Christian that never falls, you've got to have brotherly kindness. Not just kindness to everyone. I'm going to tell you about that next week. But this week, before it's everyone, you're supposed to be kind to your brothers and sisters in Christ. It's brotherly kindness. Number two, look at John chapter 13. Go to John chapter number 13. You know, there are many reasons I've heard over the years why people who are not churchgoers don't want to go to church. You probably heard many reasons too, right? All the church wants is my money. (laughs) Why don't you do the same thing when you go to Walmart? All you want is my money. (laughs) Sorry. Money makes the world go round. It amazes me that people are willing to give Wells Fargo, mortgage companies, credit card companies, car car leases, Walmarts, King Supers, Safeways, City of Longmont, XL Energy. You're willing to give all those people your money. But when it comes to God, it's like, man, don't you talk to me about money. (laughs) Whatever, man. Some people need to just grow up in life and realize that, unfortunately, whether you like it or not, money makes the world go round. Why would you give money to everybody and ignore God? It just blows my mind. It's a privilege to give to God's house and his work. It's a privilege to tithe. But there are people that won't go to church because all the church wants is my money. Well, don't ever go to a restaurant then because they're not wanting to feed you for free. Don't go to Walmart and King Supers. They don't want to pack your uh, cupboards and refrigerators up with groceries for free. You don't, you don't, I mean, just come on. That's just the way it is. But people also don't like to go to church because of, they say there are hypocrites there. People act one way at church and act a different way outside of church. But the third reason that people have told me that it's pretty common, and it's probably in this order, money, hypocrites, and then number three, too much bickering and strife in churches, backbiting, gossip slandering, um, cliques. They like a certain group of people, but they don't like another group of people. Uh, Feuding, church splits. If people had more brotherly kindness in church, it would be more attractive to those that are outside of church. People that don't go to church, sometimes they look at church and they say, why would I want to be a part of that? All they do is gossip and fight and bicker and they hate each other, and they don't, they don't get along, and it's kind of like, you know, a feud. Why would I want to go jump right in the middle of a feud? So we ought to focus on brotherly kindness because that's attractive. Um, John chapter 13, look at verses 34 and 35. It says, a new commandment I give unto you that you love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples if ye have love One to another. Number two, write this down. Brotherly kindness is the insignia of one who is devoted to Christ. Point number two. Brotherly kindness is the insignia of one who is devoted to Christ. That word insignia, it means a badge. It's kind of like someone who has a letterman's jacket. 
And they have that insignia of their school that's sewn into their letterman's jacket. What God says is this. If you would love each other like I loved you, the whole world could tell you're a devoted Christian. You're a disciple of Christ. And that's literally what Jesus was teaching to the disciples. He said, by this, what is this? The love that they have for each other. By this, this love, this brotherly kindness, shall all men know that ye are my disciples. Shall have love one for another. You know what God says? Everybody in the world can tell if you're devoted to Christ or not. And the way they can tell is not by you loving the world. It's by you loving brothers and sisters in Christ. Jesus said to the disciples, love each other. Everybody outside of this group called the local New Testament church, they'll all know that you're a disciple of mine if you love each other. That's what he said. So brotherly kindness, what is it? It's the insignia of one who's devoted to Christ. People can tell you're devoted to Christ because you love the brethren. You have love in your heart for the family of God. Number three, look at Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Verses nine and 10. Romans chapter 12, verses nine and 10. Ready? Romans chapter 12, verses nine and 10. It says, let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love. And here's the thought. In honor, preferring one another. Number three. Uh, it is talking about brotherly kindness. It is caring about brothers and sisters in Christ more than you care for yourself. Brotherly kindness is caring about brothers and sisters in Christ more then you care about yourself. That's what it says there in verse number 10. Be kindly affection one to another. We're talking about the family of God here. It says in brother, with brotherly love. Remember, if someone's not a brother in Christ, this is not talking about that. Okay, so you got to understand. There are times when God tells you to love the lost. And we'll talk about that all next week. But, there, but this is talking about brotherly love, someone who is a brother or sister in Christ, right? So brotherly love, and it says, in honor preferring one another. Do you know what that means? In honor preferring one another, that means you would prefer to have your brother happy, not you happy. You would prefer to have your brother or sister's wishes met rather than your wishes met. You would prefer them to have the good seat in the auditorium, if there is a good seat. I think the best seat in the house is right there, front row. That's called spitting distance, brother. Every preacher worth his salt spits while he's preaching. And uh, <laughs> so anyway, why is the front row vacant? Eh, maybe because I spit too much. But anyway, all right, here we go. But uh, <laughs> you got that? That was funny, Miss Tammy. All right, praise the Lord. Eh, that's right. And that's why you sit on the side because my spit projectiles usually in the front, not on the side. <laughs> But anyway, uh, how did we debase ourselves to this in our sermon this evening? But anyway, praise the Lord. Uh, caring about brothers and sisters in Christ more than you do yourself in honor, preferring one another. In other words, preferring that someone else get the best seat. Preferring that someone else goes before you in line. Preferring as you drive down the road that someone else would get in the place that you want to get in. Um, <coughs> it's funny. If we drive more kindly, it'd take care of all the road rage. I mean, it just really would. All the hustle and bustle and get out of my way, and I don't care who, where you're going, what you're doing, just get out of my way. There's no brotherly kindness there. Well, actually, there's just no kindness, period, period, no kindness. But what is brotherly kindness? It's in honor preferring one another. It is caring about your brothers and sisters in Christ more than you do about yourself. That is brotherly kindness, living for others. Next, number four. Look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. Ephesians 4 and verse number 32. Ephesians 4 and verse 32. Are you there? Amen. Amen. Ephesians 4, 32, ready? 
I'll read it. You follow along with me. Ready? And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Number four, write this down. It is treating Christians like Christ would. Brotherly kindness is treating Christians like Christ would, all right? So here's what God says. Be kind one to another. Again, we're talking about the fraternity of God's family. Be kind one to another, and here's how. Two things, he says, tenderhearted, that means having compassion, and then it says forgiving one another. When you don't forgive someone who has wronged you, you do not have brotherly kindness. And I'm just gonna be honest with you. There's too many Christians in our world that hold grudges against other Christians. We just won't forgive. We're angry, we're bitter. And I will tell you this, unforgiveness hurts you more than it hurts them. It really does. You need that forgiveness. You need to treat people like Christ would treat us. Now, sit up straight. I'm gonna teach you a song. We uh, sing this song in our school every single year. We sing this song with our kids more than once a week. It's one of those Hallmark verse scripture songs, and I want you to learn it. If, you've already know, if you already know it, sing it with me. All of you that used to be in our school, you should know this song really well, right? Don't say no, and uh, see, you're not being brotherly kind right now. But I wanna teach you this song, and I want you to learn this song through this tune, and I want you to be able to sing it out there in the world when you're driving down the street in, the, in your car, when you're cleaning the dishes or cleaning the house at your home, when you're doing whatever you're doing. Let this tune just go through your mind, off of your lips. Let's sing it. Now, if you don't know it, listen. I'll sing it for you eloquently and perfectly because I love to sing. But not everybody loves to hear. That's your problem. When we all get to heaven, God's not going to give me a better voice. He's going to give you better ears. That's what's going to happen because that's the problem with all of this, all right? Here we go. Be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. And the way the song goes is you say it twice. You just sing it through twice. That's the whole length of the song. But that's the tune. Ready? Be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. So that's the tune. All right, so listen carefully. If you all can sing that with me right now, I won't sing it again the rest of the service. But if you don't sing it with me right now, I'm gonna keep singing it until you get it. So the best thing you can do is just get it down right now. Okay, you ready? Let's sing it together. If you need to look at the verse while you sing, that's fine. But if you think you got it down, just go ahead and sing it. Ready? Be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. And so how the song goes, you just sing it through twice like that. And, uh, and the, lat the way you end it, I don't know how you end it. You just go, you, and then you're done. Okay, but anyway, uh, the fact of the matter is you ought to learn that. Be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. That's the essence of brotherly kindness. It is treating fellow Christians like Christ would treat them. If Jesus would forgive them, you forgive them. If Jesus would be compassionate toward them, tenderhearted, you be compassionate. All right, number five, go to 1 Thessalonians chapter three. 1 Thessalonians chapter number three. And this is new territory, Miss Catherine. That's why you came back tonight, amen? You wanna get the rest of the, the rest of the story. All righty, 1 Thessalonians chapter number five. And uh, last night when I preached uh, to the, 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 the people that were here in church last night, I got through point number four, points one, two, three, and four, and I said, come back tomorrow night to hear points five through nine. The Callaways came back, and uh, Miss Catherine came back. Brother David, you weren't listening. Uh, let's see here. You don't count. But uh, I think that's about it. Okay, all right, here we go. 
<laughs> and uh, uh, 1 Thessalonians, actually chapter 3. Did I say chapter 5? I meant chapter 3. I'm sorry. Forgive me. Don't crucify me. Just forgive me. All right. Be ye kind, tender heart, forgiving one another. Forgive the preacher. All right. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Look at verse 12. And the Lord made you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. Number five, write this down. Increase in brotherly kindness as time passes. Increase in brotherly kindness as time passes. You know, you can be one of two people. You ready for this? You can be a person that as time passes, you can increase in love for the brethren. Or you can be a second type of person. As time passes, you can just get more irritated with people. Everybody knows senior saints who smile all the time. They're pleasant. They're loving. In life, they have increased in their love. And every one of us knows senior saints who are crabby. They wouldn't smile for nothing. Their, their face would crack and bleed if they smiled. I mean, they're angry. They're unhappy. They're griping all the time, complaining about everything. Why? They didn't learn to increase in love or, in this particular case, brotherly kindness. I don't want to be a senior citizen that's crabby all the time. I want to be a senior citizen that just has this smile that you can't wipe off my face. I'm just happy. I'm just, life is grand. Life is wonderful. I love people. I love church. I love God. Everything's grand. Everything's wonderful. And you know what God's design for you is? It says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 12, the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another. And by the way, this is a subtle thing, but before God tells you to love all men, which is what it says in verse 12, and toward all men, you've got to get this down. He wants you to love the brethren first, all men second. That's how it always is in the Bible. It's subtle, but it's there. There's no words in the Bible that are by mistake. Before you love everybody, God says you better make sure you love God's children. One of our professors at Hiles Anderson College when I was a student, he taught this analogy. He said, if you were, oh, my soul, this uh, is facing the wrong way. There we go. All right. It was, uh, for some reason, facing the Lord's Supper table. What in the world is going on around there? No wonder I couldn't hear myself. My ears were messed up. Now I can hear myself wonderfully when I sing. Be ye kind, one, two. <laughs> I just, I love the way I sing. And church people love to hear me sing on a hill far away. All right. And uh, <laughs> that's the name of a song, if you didn't know that. On a hill far away. All right, here we go. Where was I at? Oh, yes, in conclusion, let's stand. All right, um, Hiles Anderson College. My professor, one of my professors said this in class one day. Let's just suppose, hypothetically, there are three people left on the planet, you and a brother in Christ and an unbeliever. And you had one banana. <laughs> it's kind of a crazy thing. And you can only give it to one person. Who would you give it to, to share with? And one of my college classmates raised his hand and said, give it to the unbeliever so that he can see the love of Christ in you and he'll want to get saved. And he said, well, that's a good idea, good thinking. It's just not scriptural. He said, you're supposed to give love to your brother in Christ first. And then give love to others second. So that's what the Bible teaches all through the New Testament. He always talks about it in that order when both subjects are mentioned. Love the brotherhood, brotherly love, and then love to all men. You're supposed to give love first and foremost to your brothers and sisters in Christ and then give it to everybody else after the fact. So what God tells us here is we're supposed to increase in brotherly kindness as time passes. Number six, look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, just one chapter next. Chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. But it's touching brotherly love. Ye need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. And indeed ye do it toward all the brethren which are in all Macedonia. 
But we beseech you, brethren, that ye increase more and more. Number six, write this down. Have brotherly kindness for all Christians. For all Christians. So obviously, for the most part, we were speaking about brotherly kindness for those in our church, for those that were around all the time. But in this passage, Paul was writing to the Thessalonian Christians. It says, you do it toward all the brethren which are in all Macedonia. Um, uh, it says, but we beseech you that, that you increase more and more. All right. So what he says is in verse 9, he says, uh, the church at Thessalonica, you have love in yourselves uh, toward one another in the church at Thessalonica. And then he said, and indeed you do it toward all the brethren which are in all Macedonia. So what he says is, if you ever meet a Christian, love them. Be happy to see them. You know, whenever I go door knocking, man, I had an unusual time today. Man, sometimes soul winning can just be weird. Just weird. I went soul winning with my mom today. My mom came to church, and afterwards she said, you going soul winning? I said, yes, yes, mom. She goes, when? I said, pretty much right now. She said, you got a partner? I said, no. She goes, can I go with you? I said, how much money do you have? No. Uh, but I said, sure. And uh, my mom and I went soul winning. We must have knocked on 20 doors and at least half of them, there was someone in there that would not come to the door and answer it. And then there was a three, no, two. Yeah, three that did answer the door of the 20. And they were just... I'm sorry, don't have time. Some lady came to the door with her mouth full of food and she was chewing it as she came to the door. Her door was open, by the way, rang the doorbell, and she comes up to the door. I'm sorry, but I don't have time to talk to you. I'm eating. <laughs> I went, okay, I'm sorry. And then she went back. <laughs> who answers the door with a mouth full of food and then chewing the whole time? Someone who doesn't want to talk to you, that's who does that. It's not hard to get the drift, you know. And then I met this guy uh, after about 20 of those doors, and he just moved here one month ago from Southern California and just been here for a month. And he, I said, how in the world did you pick Longmont, Colorado? He goes, well, I wanted to get out of California, and I thought, Texas or Colorado? Texas or Colorado? He said, so I chose Colorado. And he came to Longmont not knowing anybody a month ago. And I looked at him, and I said, I'm going to guess your age right now. I guess, and I looked at him, and I said, you're 24. And he went, I am. How did you know that? <laughs> I said, because I got five sons, 26, 24, 22, 20, and 17. I'm pretty good at guessing the ages of young adult men. <laughs> and, uh, and, but right when I guessed his age, at age 24, and the Holy Spirit helped me with that. Right when I said that to him, I had him. He was interested in listening to me. And I told him I grew up in California, you know, Napa. He grew up in Southern California. We chatted about the difference for a few. And, uh, but I got to lead him to Christ, and he got saved. What a blessing. But you know when I go soul winning, I said all that to say this. When I go soul winning and I knock on a door and it's another Christian who answers, like someone who genuinely is saved, it's almost like there's a camaraderie there. They're real friendly to me. We're happy to get to know each other and just to briefly meet each other. It doesn't matter who they are. If they're Christians, there ought to be that love between us. And the Bible says that's what it's talking about, love for all Christians. And by the way, when some people answer the door and they claim to be Christians, but they're angry that I knocked on their door or they're not uh, po uh, uh, polite at all, in my mind, I wonder, you probably really aren't even saved because you don't even know how to love the brotherhood. I mean, all I did was knock on your door. Y'all, you, you know, every once in a while I ask people, "Do you know for sure if you die today that you'll go to heaven?" Or has anybody ever showed you from the Bible how you can know for sure you're going to go to heaven? And there are some people who claim to be Christians, and they get mad at me when I just ask the question. I'm like, "What in the world? Do you understand that I am caring about you enough to see if you're saved, and that's a good thing?" You know, when I have people come to our church. The majority of the people, when I ask them, do they know for sure if they'll go to heaven one day, they're okay with me asking it. But every once in a while, there's someone that just absolutely gets irritated just because I asked. And you know what? You know what I say to people? I've been pastoring this church for 28 years and living in this community for 28 years. 
Do you know how many people have asked me if I knew for sure when I died I'd go to heaven and cared enough about my soul to ask me? Now, these are people that don't even know that I'm a pastor. I'm not talking about people that know that I'm a pastor. I'm just talking about, do you know how many people have given me a gospel track in 28 years? I think one person has given me a gospel track in 28 years. And I think zero people have asked me if I knew for sure when I died I'd go to heaven. You know what I think about that? Do people not care if I'm going to heaven or not? You know, when I'm out there in the public, not everybody just immediately knows that I'm a pastor. But I'm a person. I'm a person. I'm amazed. Do you know how many preachers have knocked on my door in 28 years? Absolutely zero. I've had Mormons knock on my door. I've had Jehovah Witnesses knock on my door. I had one person that was passing out flyers for vacation Bible school from a Baptist church in this town knock on my door. I have had zero pastors knock on my door and invite me to church or even care of whether or not I was saved. Zero pastors in this whole town. Now, I'm just telling you something right now. That's just not right. And, I, and, and God says we should have brotherly kindness for all Christians, whether they come to our church or not. We ought to care and love each other. And if we see each other out in public, it ought to be a camaraderie. It ought to be a, I love you, and it, we're going to be in heaven forever, and we're on the right side, and thank God God is our Father, and we're saved, and, and we ought to have that camaraderie. Now, love, brotherly kindness for all Christians. Number seven, 1 Peter chapter 1. Go to the right, just a few books. By the way, just in case you're wondering, there's over 60 churches approximately in Longmont. You, you have a pastor that cares about the lost souls of people in this community. I've knocked on your door. I knock on all kinds of doors. But I've never had one other pastor in this town knock on my door. And I'm just telling you, don't, don't ever just dismiss Hopewell in your mind and in your heart. This is a special place. Not every church in town is like Hopewell. We care about people. And I don't mean we say we care. I mean we do care. and We love each other. And we try to reach the loss for the cause of Christ. Um, 1 Peter chapter 1, look at verse 22. Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. Now, that word unfeigned, we don't use that word very much anymore. There's one word that that's a synonym to, and it starts with the letter S. The word unfeigned means, do you know what it means? Does anybody here know? It means sincere. That's what we use. That's the word that we use, be sincere. But in the Bible times, it was unfeigned so number seven your love for christians should be sincere it should be that's what the word unfeigned means it means sincere the word feign is kind of like like empty the word feign it means to be empty and meaningless and the word un is the opposite of empty and meaningless which means sincere and so back in the Bible days in 1611 when they translated the Bible in the King James Version, the word unfeigned was very, very popular and people said it all the time and they knew what that meant. But now it's kind of an archaic English word. We don't go around saying, Miss Sue, don't be unfeigned or Miss Sue, be, be unfeigned. That's what I meant to say. <laughs> See, it's even confusing to me. Uh, be unfeigned. That means be sincere, right? And, um, and you don't, parents tell your children, be unfeigned. <laughs> You say, be sincere when you talk. And, uh, but the fact is, that's the kind of love we're supposed to have for each other. Unfeigned love of the brethren. That means sincere love of the brethren. In other words, don't sit there and say, I love you, but I don't like you. You know what that is? You ready? That is a cop-out. Have you ever heard someone say that? Have you ever said it yourself? I love them, but I don't like them. That means your love is insincere. It's not sincere. Because if you really did love someone, you would like them. And I don't mean 
I don't mean you approve of their behavior, right? If they do something wrong, I'm not trying to say, if you love them, you say, that's okay. No, I'm not talking about compromise, but there's some mentality of, well, I can love you, but I don't like you. In other words, is there somebody in this church, listen to this statement, is there somebody that's in this church that if all the seats were filled and you came to church and there was only one seat open and it was next to that person, would it bum you out for the service? Would you sit there and go, oh, I have to sit next to her, him? That means you could say, well, I love you, brother. I just don't like you very much. You stink. You have annoying habits. You irritate me. You say amen too loudly. You say amen at the wrong time. You laugh at jokes that I don't think are fun. No, but anyway, uh, no, if you have sincere love for the brethren, it's not like, well, I love you, but I don't like you. No, no. If you love them, you like them too. And again, I'm not trying to say that you compromise or that you uh, um, allow that what they do that's wrong, that you say it's okay. No, it's not okay if they do wrong but you ought to love people sincerely. Next, number eight, we're almost done. First John chapter three. Go to first John chapter three. It's right before second John and third John. Just to help you out. <laughs> first John chapter three. Look at verse 14. Hey, we're doing really, really good on time. We're not late at all. This is great. I can preach for another 25 minutes and still be on time, but I'm not going to. 1 John chapter 3, in case you're wondering. Look at verse 14. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 14, it says this, We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. Ready? He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Number eight, you will abide in death if you do not love your brethren. You'll abide in death. You know what that means? Your life is miserable, meaningless, empty. It's death. Why? Because you don't love the brethren. God says, he that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Now, all of these verses that we're talking about, the primary application is the family of God. But you can also apply this stuff to your own personal family. You want death in your family, in your household? Then don't love each other. There'll be death there. But the fact of the matter is, God says you live in death if you don't love the brethren. It's not a fun way to live. It's just not a fun way to live. Let's love each other. All right, number nine and last. Let's go back to the beginning. Ready? Genesis chapter 13. Go all the way back to the beginning. If we would have ended with the beginning, it would have been done a long time ago. <laughs> that was funny. Okay, if you don't laugh, I'm going to sing. Be ye kind, love to another. Tender hearted, forgive another. <laughs> Even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Okay, here we go. 13. Yeah, Brother Hiles used to always say, if you don't laugh at my jokes, I'm going to sing. I'm going to sing. <laughs> and Brother Hiles had a worse singing voice than I have. All right, Genesis chapter 13. <laughs> Look down at verse number 8. Genesis chapter 13 and verse number 8. And Abraham said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray, thee between me and thee, and between my herdmen and thy herdmen. Here's why. Ready? For we be brethren. Number 9 and last. Brotherly kindness removes strife between Christians. Brotherly kindness removes strife between Christians. You know what that means? It literally means it's hard for you to be angry at someone and fight with someone if you really do love them. Do you know who it's easy to fight with? People you don't love. You know, you ever, you ever drive down the road in the car and have you ever told someone off? Have you ever told someone which direction is up? Have you ever yelled at someone while you're driving? Have you ever cursed at them? Well, first of all, 
If you have, come down the altar and get right with God. Uh, I don't think you got to curse the people. I mean, I'm not trying to advocate any of that stuff. But have you ever driven down the road and, and was unkind to someone? You know why? Because you don't know who they are. They're complete strangers to you. And it's completely easy to be angry at someone you don't care about. But if you knew that person, if you love that person, you would be less likely to have road rage toward them. You'd be less likely to be irritated toward them. You'd be less likely to say some words that you would regret saying toward them because you love them. But if it's someone you don't know and someone that you don't love, then it's easy to be angry. Have you ever gotten angry at someone in line or, you know, at a, at a business or at a restaurant or angry at an employee? And, you know, every once in a while I see these videos of people in public that really have a lot of poor behavior. You know, sometimes people are videoing people and they're out of control and they're angry. But guess what they're most of the time they're angry at, if not all the time? Someone that they don't love. Because if you love someone, strife kind of goes away. It's, it's harder to be agitated and angry with. You know, when people don't get along, I think it's mostly a love issue. When people don't get along with others, it's like, do you really love that person? Well, why are you constantly getting, you know, getting angry at them? Or someone that's being disrespectful to authority. You know what the problem is? You don't really love your authority. That's why you're being disrespectful and all that strife. Love would cure it all. And God says brotherly kindness is a factor in removing strife. But we're talking about strife be between Christians. All right, sit up straight. Let's review. And then you can go back to sleep. I mean, then you can go home. All right. Brotherly kindness is fraternal affection. It's the love which Christians cherish for each other as brothers and sisters in the family of God. Kindness, that temper or disposition which delights in contributing to the happiness of others, exercised cheerfully in gratifying their wishes, supplying their wants, and alleviating their distresses. Brotherly kindness is the insignia or the badge that one is devoted to Christ. It's caring about brothers and sisters in Christ more than yourself. It's treating Christians like Christ would. Brotherly kindness is something that God desires that we increase as time passes. We should have brotherly kindness for all Christians, not just those who come to our church. Your love for Christians should be sincere. In other words, like them too. Don't just say, I love you, but I don't like you. No, like them and, love them and like them. Your love for Christians should be sincere. You will abide in death if you do not love your brother. And brotherly kindness removes strife. If you love someone, you don't fight with them as much. It's easy to fight with those you don't love. You know what we need if we never want to fall as Christians? We need brotherly kindness. If you'd get it, it would help you not to ever fall. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be here this evening. I love you, Jesus, and I love these dear people. I really do. I'm glad they're a part of our church family. And Lord, it's my sincerest desire to help them tonight to live a, such a Christian life that they would never fall. And I know this, brotherly kindness is very much important part of never falling. Heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. Did God speak to your heart tonight about brotherly kindness did he speak to your heart specifically about something direct i'd love to pray for you if he did preacher pray for me god spoke to me directly would you pray for me raise your hand preacher god spoke to me heavenly father you see all the hands that are raised i'm sure you spoke to everyone differently but lord you did speak to them and they acknowledged it would you bless them if they respond positively if they do exactly what you tell them to do would you bless them? Lord, if there's anybody here that needs to be saved, if there's anybody here who needs to be baptized, please help them to make those important decisions tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Shall we stand? The pianist will play. If God spoke to your heart, come and pray. Make whatever decision that God wants you to make tonight.